Registrar, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me this evening to extend a very warm UCD welcome to Professor Hilary Putnam and his wife, Professor Ruth Ann Putnam. Professor Hilary Putnam is Cogan University Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at Harvard. His visit and, and that of his wife is a singular honour for the UCD School of Philosophy and the College of Human Sciences. Professor Putnam is one of the most eminent philosophers of our time. His work is characterised both by the range of his interests. Professor Putnam has made a major contribution to the philosophy of mind, philosophy of language and philosophy of science. And his willingness to question all established positions, including those of one Hilary Putnam himself, which is always a great characteristic in, a, in, in an academic. His 1995 Harvard volume, Renewing Philosophy, is particularly noteworthy in this regard. As a teacher, Professor Putnam has inspired several generations of students, many of whom have become eminent philosophers in their own right. It is a tribute to Hilary Putnam as a teacher, colleague and a human being that dozens of the most eminent philosophers of our, our time, three dozen to be exact, many of them former students, will conjugate in UCD next week to pay tribute to him and his work in celebration of his 80th birthday. I've looked at the conference programme and there's no doubt that for four days next week UCD will be the philosophical capital of the world. Hilary Putnam has been central to attempts to break down that unhelpful division between analytic and continental philosophy and in this as well as in his pluralistic approach to both politics and metaphysics his work is reflected in the ethos and character of the UCD School of Philosophy. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Putnam to you this evening. His lecture is entitled The Fact, Value, Dichotomy and Its Critics. Professor Putnam. You are too generous. Thank you so much. My favorite definition of philosophy, due to Stanley Cavell, is, three, is a three-word definition. Philosophy is education for grown-ups. Today, I shall be discussing an issue that is obviously a philosophical one, at the same time, one in which many who certainly consider themselves grown-ups, including many philosophers, economists, lawyers, and policymakers of all kinds, unquestionably need education. That is the issue that I described in the a book, The Collapse of the Fact-Value Dichotomy, that I published in this new century, as the fact-value dichotomy. That, in that, I, that book began thus. Every one of you has heard someone ask, is that supposed to be a fact or a value judgment? The presupposition of this stumper, especially when in that sort of snarly tone of voice, is that if it's a value judgment, it can't possibly be a statement of fact. And a further presupposition is that value judgments are subjective. I illustrated the way in which this idea can impact policy by citing the views of Lionel Robbins in 1932. At that time, Robbins, arguably the most influential, certainly one of the most influential economists in the world, argued against the whole idea of income redistribution. And he was arguing that at the depths of the Depression, mind you, on two philosophic grounds. Not on economic grounds, but on two philosophic grounds. The first of which I won't discuss here was that, according to him, interpersonal comparisons of utility are meaningless. This is a claim in the philosophy of mind, a skeptical position in the philosophy of mind, in fact, but that's not my subject tonight. But the second, which is my topic tonight, was that value judgments are, according to him, outside the sphere of reason altogether. I quote uh, from Lionel Robbins now, if we disagree about ends, it is a case of thy blood or mine, or live and let live, according to the importance of the difference or the relative strength of our opponents. But if we disagree about means, then scientific analysis can often help us resolve our differences. And then he gives an example, but he could have used any moral issue as an example. 
If we disagree about the morality of the taking of interest and we understand what we are talking about, then there's no room for argument. Other influential economists in the 30s, 40s, and 50s of the last century, while no less respectful of logical positivism and its insistence that value judgments totally lack what the positivists called cognitive meaning, were unwilling to follow Robinson in jettisoning welfare economics. Instead, they allowed the economist to appeal to values, provided it was made clear that all that she was doing was making means-ends judgments of the form, if you have such and such values, then such and such is the most feasible economic policy. But the idea that values themselves do not admit of rational argument was not challenged. Thus Samuelson, certainly the most influential of the liberal economists, wrote in 1947, it is fashionable for the modern economists to insist that ethical value judgments have no place in scientific analysis. Professor Robbins in particular has insisted upon this point, and today it is customary to make a distinction between the pure analysis of Robbins, qua economists, and his propaganda, condemnations, and policy recommendations, qua citizen. In practice, if pushed to extremes, this somewhat schizophrenic rule proves difficult to adhere to, and it leads to rather tedious circumlocutions. But in essence, Robinson is undoubtedly correct. In this way, the logical positivists claim that why people respond favorably to certain facts and unfavorably to others is merely a question for the sociologist, that's a quotation from Freddie Ayer, uh, came to be regarded as, in Samuelson's words, undoubtedly correct by a policy science whose recommendations impact the lives of literally billions of our fellow inhabitants of this planet, of our fellow human beings. Ethical questions are the questions that most of us think it most important to discuss rationally and not irrationally. But if the logical positive view that economists deferred to for such a long time were indeed correct, then the very idea of discussing value questions rationally would be cognitively nonsense. I mentioned Stanley Cavell's definition of philosophy as, as education for grown-ups. And one reason I did that is that he has an important place in the debate concerning facts and values. If this is not obvious, the reason I believe is a strange way in which one of Cavell's most important contributions has been neglected by his admirers as well as by his critics. I'm referring to the four chapters which make up part three titled Knowledge and the Concept of Morality of his masterwork, The Claim of Reason. I mean, parts one, two, and four have received huge attention. I just said that if the logical positivist view that economists deferred to for such a long time were indeed correct, then the very idea of discussing value questions rationally would be nonsense. But in my time, and Cavell's, and we're almost exactly the same age, Many analytic philosophers became acquainted with, and alas, often embraced that idea as a result of reading Charles Stevenson's book, Ethics and Language, rather than the logical positivists themselves. And although Stevenson's affinity to logical positivism was recognized immediately, the irrationalist consequences of emotivism are intentionally played down in Stevenson's book. In this part of the claim of reason titled Knowledge and the Concept of Morality, Cavell is concerned from the beginning to expose the points at which that irrationalism nevertheless permeates Stevenson's book. And it's not very well hidden since Stevenson tell, tells us very early on that there's no such thing as a valid argument in ethics. It's not really <laughs> very well hidden at all. <laughs> Stevenson's, what Stevenson calls his first question is this. What is the nature of ethical agreement and disagreement? Is it parallel to that found in the natural sciences, differing only with regard to the subject matter, 
or is it of some broadly different source? And his well-known answer was that the disagreements that occur in science, history, biography are disagreements in belief, whereas it is disagreement in attitude that chiefly distinguishes ethical issues from those of science. Where a disagreement is in attitude, Stevenson does say that reasons can be offered for and against, but he says that these reasons are related only psychologically, uh, that is, causally, uh, since not deductively and not inductively, to the judgments they support. In other words, we call reasons in ethics are just methods of persuasion. No reason is more logically relevant or valid than any other. Stevenson assumes, as is too often assumed today, that all disagreements in science, what he call, or disagreements about facts, these notions are often simply equated, can be settled either deductively or inductively, and that, su and that such settlement results in agreement. That not all moral disagreements can be so settled is another of Stevenson's reasons for concluding that these are not disagreements in belief. For he argues that only on the assumption that all disagreement in attitude is, re is rooted in disagreement in belief can moral disagreements be settled by rational proof. And this he calls a dubious psychological generalization. One of Stevenson's early examples of what he calls the methods used in moral arguments is the following. A, speaking to C, a child. To neglect your piano practice is naughty. B, in C's hearing. No, C is very good about practicing out of C's hearing. It's hopeless to drive him, you know, but if you praise him, he will do a great deal. So, the first example of a moral argument, of the methods used in moral argument, is lying to a child. <laughs> as Cavell remarks, one wonders why such examples as much as seem to be examples of moral encounter to Stevenson. In fact, the possibility that morality has characteristic modes of argument which distinguish it from, inter alia, mere rhetoric and propaganda is explicitly ruled out by Stevenson. But the investigation of such modes of argument and the modes of description that they presuppose is precisely what has always concerned the best moral philosophers up to and including Cavell. In addition, Cavell writes, but suppose that it just is just characteristic of moral arguments, that the rationality of the antagonists is not dependent on an agreement emerging between them, that there is such a thing as a rational disagreement about a conclusion. Without the hope of agreement, without the hope of agreement, argument would be pointless. But it doesn't follow that without agreement, and in particular, apart from agreement arrived at in particular ways, that is, apart, e.g., apart from bullying, and without agreement about a conclusion concerning what ought to be done, the argument was pointless. But if, as Cavell suggests here, there is such a thing as a rational argument which cannot be conclusively settled, then the whole argument from the existence of irresolvable disagreements in ethics to the absence of cognitive meaning in ethics collapses. In fact, as I pointed out in uh, a later book, Ethics Without Ontology, there are factual issues, especially in the social sciences, on which it is difficult and perhaps impossible to get agreement. Summing up these opening observations in knowledge and the concept of morality, Cavell already lists four points on which he disagrees with Stevenson. One, that all Stevenson's claim that all disagreement in attitude is moral disagreement. Two, that all disagreements which cannot be rationally settled, that is, end in a conclusion which all parties agree is the right one, are irrational. Three, that a reason which is neither deductively nor inductively related to a judgment is therefore only psychologically related to it. Four, that what makes science rational is that it consists of beliefs about matters of fact and hence consists of methods which rationally settle disagreements. Cavell 
remarks that Stevenson's view requires or contains all of these ideas, and he must obviously take them to be obvious in themselves or to follow, obviously, from the fact that there are different kinds of disagreement. Given what I take to be the remorseless paradoxicality of his view, its wide acceptance, despite criticisms of pieces of his view which would have seemed essential to it, for example, of his causal theory of meaning, and in particular of emotive meaning, and still particularly of his analysis of the word good, must mean that these assumptions are widely shared. They are indeed widely shared assumptions. In fact, they become a sort of cultural institution as characteristic of philosophical views. So when they become culturally institutionalized, they tend to go on and on, even though the very philosophers who accept them agree that many of the arguments for them are terrible. And it's because I think that that cultural institution is a be an unfortunate one that I've devoted a good deal of my writing in the last quarter of a century to attacking it. That's why I began this lecture, by describing this as an issue where education for grown-ups is desperately needed. I've argued, sometimes in concert with the economist and philosopher Vivian Walsh, that the intellectual legs, who is Irish by the way, that the intellectual legs on which the fact-value dichotomy stood are now in ruin. But to see that that's the case, one needs to bring together results from different parts of philosophy. I was asked this morning whether this is a lecture for a general audience or not, or, not, or for specialists. And I guess my answer is that certainly the subject is one for a general audience, but there are parts of it where I will have to get technical. <laughs> Specifically, one needs to bring together the observations by different philosophers of the ways in which so-called factual and so-called evaluative predicates are mutually entangled, the way in which it is a fantasy to suppose that the predicates we use to give sensitive and relevant descriptions of human beings and human interactions can be disentangled into two components, a purely descriptive component and an evaluative component. And that observation has to be combined with the observation first made long ago by Morton White that Quine's demolition of the logical positivist dichotomy of theory and observational fact, or fact and convention in Quine's terminology, also destroyed the logical positivist arguments for the fact-value dichotomy. It was the prestige of the logical positivist arguments that had such a powerful influence on the social scientist such as the economists of whom I spoke at the beginning of this lecture. The logical positivist arguments in question depended on a serious effort. One con continued over many years. No one can doubt the seriousness, the intellectual seriousness of the logical positivists. To draw a clear line between factual propositions, theoretical postulates, which they eventually came to regard as only partially interpreted, and mathematical logical propositions, mathematical logical propositions which they took to be analytic, true by ex v terminorum, by the very meaning of the words, and pseudo propositions, or nonsense, which latter include, that was their term, nonsense, which included, according to Carnap, quotes, all statements belonging to metaphysics, regulative ethics, and epistemology, or metaphysical epistemology. So, positivists then had, in a sense, a fourfold distinction. And it was important to them that all these be separate boxes, the factual box, the theoretical box, the mathematical logical box, and the nonsense box, which was the wastebasket category. <clears throat> the sequence of attempts to draw this fourfold dichotomy was summed up by one of the leading logical positivists, C.G. Hempel, in a famous paper published in 1950, which closed with a proposal which was accepted by Carnap and his followers. In brief, following Hempel's suggestion, the logical positivists liberalized their famous criterion of cognitive significance, sometimes called their, the verifiability theory of meaning, by holding that cognitively meaningful language could contain not only observation terms and terms defined in terms of these, but also the so-called theoretical terms, terms 
referring to unobservables and introduced by systems of postulates, the postulates of the various scientific theories. As, uh, as I earlier remarked and as Kuhn and others have also remarked, the idea that theoretical ter- that there are no pure observation terms, that observation terms are themselves theoretically loaded, is one that they didn't exactly deny but simply ignored. <laughs> As long as the system as a whole enables us to predict our experiences more successfully than we could without them, theoretical predicates, predicates, especially predicates referring to unobservables like electron, gene, quark, gravitational field, and so on, were now to be accepted as, quotes, empirically meaningful. Commenting on this situation in 1956, Morton White dryly remarked that the positivists now propose to call certain expressions meaningful to begin with, say the, the primitives of the various scientific theories, and to call others meaningful if and only if they bear specified relations to those that were first called meaningful. In this way, the criterion of meaning does not rise up from natural language, but is handed down in a legislative way. The theorist of meaning specifies a certain list of observable predicates or sentences which he labels as meaningful. Moreover, the assumption that the aim of science is prediction itself leads to a serious problem. To predict anything means, on the logical positivist account, to deduce observation sentences from a theory. And to deduce anything from a set of empirical postulates we need not only those postulates, but also the axioms of mathematics and logic. I mean, if you look, for example, at Maxwell's equations, which you sometimes find on uh, the T-shirts of your colleagues in the sciences here, uh, you will not see a set of sentences from which you can derive any observation sentences using only first-order logic. You'll see a, a series of mysterious mathematical symbols. The axioms of mathematics are absolutely indispensable in getting any predictions at all. And according to the logical positivists, mathematical sentences don't state facts at all. They are supposedly analytic and thus empty of factual content. One time they tried the idea that they're true by convention. In short, belonging to the language of science was according to Hempel's proposal, a criterion of scientific significance, but not everything scientifically significant could be regarded by the positivists as a statement of fact. Within the scientifically significant, there are, according to them, analytic as well as synthetic statements. Thus, the search for satisfactory demarcation of the factual became the search for a satisfactory way of drawing the analytic synthetic distinction. I tell this story more slowly in uh, the the book I mentioned, The Collapse of the Fact-Value Dichotomy, and in a way it goes back all the way to David Hume because the positivist's original criterion of of what a fact is was essentially Hume's. A fact is something you could see, hear, smell. You could have a sensory image of. At that point, however, in 1950, Quine demolished the metaphysically inflated notion of the analytic. I call it metaphysically inflated because what the positives did was take a term which had applied only to trifling truths, like all bachelors are unmarried, and suddenly announced that in some new metaphysically inflated sense, all mathematical truths including, as we now know from the marvelous work of Andrew Wiles Fermo's last there, are just analytic truths. Well, in 1950, Quine demolished that notion of the analytic to the satisfaction of most philosophers. But he did not suggest that every statement in the language of science should be regarded as a statement of fact, that is, as synthetic. Instead, Quine suggested that the whole idea of classifying such statements as the statements of pure mathematics as, quotes, factual or, quotes, conventional, which the positives equated with analytic, was hopeless. As Quine later put it, the lore of our fathers is a fabric of sentences. In our hands it develops and changes to more or less arbitrary and deliberate revisions and additions of our own, more or less directly occasioned by the continuing stimulation of our sense organs. 
It is a pale gray lore, black with fact and white with convention. But I have found no substantial reasons for concluding that there are any quite black threads in it or any white ones. But if we lack any clear notion of fact, which is the situation as of 1950, what happens to the fact-value dichotomy? As Vivian Walsh has written, to borrow and adapt Quine's vivid image, if a theory may be black with fact and white with convention, it, not, it might well, as far as logical empiricism could tell, be red with values. Since for them, confirmation or falsification had to be a property of a theory as a whole, they had no way of unraveling this whole cloth. If the logical positivist arguments are now generally regarded as failures, which doesn't mean that their conclusions have ceased to exert a powerful influence, it must be said to their credit that those arguments were the product of years of careful effort as the successive reformulations of the so-called empiricist criterion of meaning chartered by Hempel testify. Chartered by Hempel testify. Although it was his high regard for logical positivism that inspired Stevenson to defend their emotivist views, his own arguments for a fact value or belief attitude dichotomy rest on no such hard work. For him, it's self-evident, as Cavell pointed out in his list of Stevenson's assumptions, that genuine beliefs can be proved or refuted by deduction or induction, and that is the only criterion of cognitive meaning Stevenson thinks he needs. And now come to the topic of fact, value, entanglement. Facts and values are entangled in at least two senses. First, factual judgments, even in physics, depend on and presuppose epistemic values. One would think this ought to be uncontroversial, but in fact all the leading positivists, joined here by Popper in spite of his frequently touted disagreements with Carnap and Reichenbach, made but what I regard as pathetic attempts to evade the role of the normative in scientific methodology. What the logical positivists were shutting their eyes to as so many today who refer to values as purely subjective and science as purely objective continue to shut their eyes to, is obvious. The fact that judgments of coherence, simplicity, which is itself a whole bundle of different values, by the way, not just one parameter, beauty, this was uh, Dirac's favorite term. Fred Hoyle once told me that Dirac said to Hoyle, uh, Fred, you don't know when a theory is beautiful. <laughs> Uh, naturalness, etc. These values are, Einstein spoke of the inner perfection of a theory. These methodological values are presupposed by physical science, and all of these are values. All of the standard arguments for non cognitivism in ethics could be repeated without any change for non cognitivism in epistemology. For example, Hume's argument that ethical values are not matters of fact because we don't have a sense impression of goodness, could be modified to read epistemic values are not matters of fact because we don't have a sense impression of simplicity or sense impression of coherence. Certainly, disagreements about the beauty or inner perfection in Einstein's sense of a theory could be described as differences in attitude. And when it comes to fields less subject to experimental control in physics, Fields like history or economics, or today the question is to what extent string theory is subject to experimental control, has <laughs> even reached the public press. In these areas, it's utterly simplistic to suppose that such disagreements can always be settled by induction and deduction. In fact, after the publication of Nelson Goodman's The New Riddle of Induction in 1946, the whole idea that there is such a thing as the method of induction has seemed to most philosophers of science to be empty. A second way in which values and facts are entangled might be described as logical or grammatical. What is characteristic of negative descriptions, like cruel, as well as of positive descriptions, like brave, temperate, just, notice these are just the terms that Socrates kept forcing his interlocutors to focus on again and again, is that to use these terms with any discrimination, one has to be able to understand an evaluative point of view. 
That's why someone who thinks that brave simply means not afraid to risk life and limb would not be able to understand the all-important distinction that Socrates kept drawing between mere rashness or foolhardiness and genuine bravery. It's also the reason that, as Iris Murdoch stressed in her important book titled The Sovereignty of Good, that it's always possible to improve one's understanding of a concept like bravery or justice. If one did not at any point feel the appeal of the relevant ethical point of view, one wouldn't be able to acquire a thick ethical concept, and sophisticated use of it requires a continuing ability to identify with it, at least in imagine, to identify at least in imagination with that point of view. My description of this phenomenon as entanglement in the collapse of the fact-value dichotomy and subsequently was suggested to me by John McDowell's use of the phrase disentangling maneuver in his important article, Non-Cognitivism and Rule Following. There he described a move made by a motivist somewhat more recent than Stevenson, thus. Typically, non-cognitivists hold that when we feel impelled to ascribe value to something, what is happening can be disentangled into two components. Com competence with an evaluative concept involves first a sensitivity to an aspect of the world as it really is, as it is independently of value experience, and secondly, a propensity to a certain attitude, a non-cognitive state that constitutes the special perspective from which items in the world seem to be endowed with the value in question. And he remarks, now it seems reasonable to be skeptical about whether the disentangling maneuver here envisaged can always be affected. Specifically about whether corresponding to any value concept, one can always isolate a genuine feature of the world by the appropriate standard of genuineness, that is a feature that is there anyway, independently of anyone's value experience being as it is, to be that to which competent users of the concept are to be regarded as responding when they use it that which is left in the world when one peels off the reflection of the appropriate attitude. To appreciate why McDowell believes that this claim is so dubious, he asks us to consider any specific conception of a moral virtue. And he continues, if the disentangling maneuver is always possible, that implies that the extension of the associated term, as it would be used by someone who belonged to the community, could be mastered independently of the special concerns that in the community would show themselves in admiration or emulation of actions seen as falling under the concept. That is, one can know which action, actions the term would be applied to so that one would be able to predict applications and withholdings of it in new cases, not merely without oneself sharing the community's admiration, there need be no difficulty about that, but without even embarking on an attempt to make sense of their admiration. Later in this essay, McDowell connects this discussion with a discussion of Cavell's views and of Wittgenstein's views as interpreted by Cavell in Must You Mean What We Say, an interpretation that McDowell likes. Cavell expands upon that interpretation in part two of the claim of reason. And indeed, entangled terms are spoken of repeatedly in knowledge and the concept of morality. One of the earliest such places is the following. C I mean, Cavell now. If we take the case of some specific action, then we might take a case in which the action in question is described in ethically prejudicial terms, e.g., ought he to have murdered him rather than killed him? Or was he wrong to betray him rather than to refuse to do what he said? Or else we might feel that any agreement about the morality of an act will turn on some agreement about how the act is to be described. Was it really breaking a promise? Is it fair just to say he lied when what he did was to lie in order to, or as a way of? And at this point, Cavell quotes Socrates, then in moral disputes, they, mankind, men, do not disagree over whether the quest, over whether the question whether the unjust individual must over the question whether the unjust individual must be punished. They disagree over the question who is unjust and what was done and when. Do they not? In other words, they just Socrates observes precisely that the entangled agreement and disagreement on the application of the entangled term is what is disagreed over. Apparently what the case in question is, this is still Cavell, what the case in question is forms part of the content of the moral argument itself. Actions, unlike 
envelopes and goldfinches do not come named for assessment, nor like apples ripe for grading. Yet for all that I've just said, there's an important difference between Cavell's and McDowell's views. Although each of them accepts the idea that a competent use of what I've called entangled terms requires that one understand an evaluative point of view, an idea that dates back to Philippa Foote and Iris Murdoch in the 1950s, if not earlier, their understandings of the nature and function of the moral life seem to me quite different. What makes knowledge and the concept of morality so important, in my opinion, is the originality and profundity of the picture of morality that informs it. McDowell, as is well known, defends a philosophical view of perception with Kantian roots. He will be talking about perception here, by the way. In with yeah, in a couple of days. A view in which perception, indeed all experience, is conceptualized. His account of morality is dependent, and I think overly dependent, on that view of perception. In McDowell's account, ethical judgments are justified by conceptualized experiences, as all judgments in the end are justified on his view. The concept involved are just the entangled concepts we've been speaking of. And with their aid, we are able to perceive that certain actions are cruel or considerate, honest or morally dubious, etc. The possession of those concepts is a large part of what McDowell calls, following Aristotle, our second nature. And that second nature is one we come to have via a proper moral education. An examination of that view is not my topic today. But one feature that stands out is that moral disagreement is far in the background in McDowell's account. But what is most distinctive about Cavell's description of morality in part three of the claim of reason is precisely the centrality of disagreement. In a passage I'm especially fond of, Cavell describes the function of morality thus. Morality must leave itself open to repudiation. It's a remarkable sense. Morality must leave itself open to repudiation. It provides one possibility of settling conflict, a way of encompassing conflict which allows the continuance of personal relationships against the hard and apparently inevitable fact of misunderstanding, mutually incompatible wishes, commitments, loyalties, interests, and needs, a way of mending relationships and maintaining the self in opposition to itself or others. Other ways of settling or encompassing conflict are provided by politics, religion, love and forgiveness, rebellion, and withdrawal. Morality is a valuable way because the others are so often inaccessible or brutal. But it is not everything. It provides a door through which someone alienated or in danger of alienation from another through his action can return by the offering and the acceptance of explanation, excuses, and justifications, or by the respect one human being will show another who sees and can accept the responsibility for a position which he himself would not adopt. We do not have to agree with one another in order to live in the same moral world, but we do have to know and respect one another's differences. Now that's a passage which requires many readings to be fully appreciated. What Cavell is getting at cannot be stated in a nutshell. It has obvious points of connection with democratic theory. Like morality, democracy is a valuable way because the others are so often inaccessible or brutal. It is Kantian in the emphasis based on mutual respect, but Kant is criticized by Cavell because, quote, the most serious sense in which Kant's moral theory is formalist comes not from his ha having said that actions motivated only in certain ways are moral actions, but in his having found too little difficulty in saying what the maxim of an action is in terms of which his test of its morality, the categorical imperative, is to be applied. The categorical imperative says, so ask yourself whether the maxim of your action is one you're willing to have everyone accept. And Cavell's obvious emphasis on knowing and respecting differences needs to be tempered by the reading of part four of the claim of reason, in which what he calls the truth or moral of skepticism turns out to problematize, problematize existentially, not just intellectually, 
the notion of knowing one another's differences. It's not surprising to me that Cavell has recently begun to talk more and more about Levinas. But in a sense, this is the whole point of the claim of reason. To say that there is a truth in skepticism isn't to say that the skeptic is right or the skepticism is flat out true. Entangled terms do have extensions and we often get their uses right. Who is to say when that happens? Each of us has that responsibility. This is the point at which each of us has sometimes to say, in Cavell's words, I rest on myself as my foundation. In closing, I sometimes imagine myself confronted with an objector who said to me, I grant you that Cavell's work is education for grown-ups, but so is the work of any significant writer. And Cavell's work is hardly typical of what's called philosophy by most professors and graduate students in philosophy departments. Can philosophy in this more conventional sense ever be, ever be what Cavell means by that phrase? I've approached this challenge indirectly, and I've done so by looking at what I've referred to as the collapse of the fact-value dichotomy and at Cavell's own contribution to that collapse. But, and this is important, I didn't confine my attention to Cavell's contribution, although I did describe it in some detail. Nevertheless, I had to leave out of my account a great deal that is important because discussing all of it would have made this lecture much longer than it is. I also described what I see as Quine's contribution, even if he was willfully ignorant of the fact that he was undermining a dichotomy that he loved. A metaphor that Vivian Walsh and I use in this connection is the following. When we think of the logical positivist fact-value dichotomy and of the emotivist account of ethical language that goes with it as the top of a three-legged stool, the three legs were, one, the postulation of theory-free facts leading to their dichotomy of fact and theory, or experience and convention. Two, the denial that fact, science, and evaluation are entangled. And three, the claim that science proceeds by a syntactically describable method called induction. The fact that even theoretical physics presupposes epistemic values means that if value judgments were really cognitively meaningful, meaningless, all science would rest on judgments that are nonsense. That's why both Carnap and Reichenbach tried so hard to show that science proceeds by an algorithm, a computer program. And the reason Popper tried to show that science needs only deductive logic. Thus the failure of the third leg is also a failure of the second leg. But the second leg also broke because, as we have seen, facts and values, ethical values, are entangled at the level of single predicates. And the first leg broke because the two dogmas on which it was based were refuted by Quine. I wish to emphasize that this, the destruction of the fact-value dichotomy was a ta task that it took many brilliant women and men and many years of the last century to accomplish. I say accomplish and not complete because philosophical tasks are never completed, really. Th those women and men are associated in the, in the textbooks with their unfortunate love of such classifications with many different kinds of philosophy. Quine was a high analytic philosopher, if ever there was one, and close to the logical positivist movement, even if he turned out to be its severest critic. Morton White was sympathetic both to Quine's brand of analytic philosophy and to ordin Oxford Ordinary Language philosophy as practiced by Gilbert Ryle, among others. There's no, that there's no algorithm for doing science was stressed by Ernest Nagel and also by the most celebrated philosopher-scientist Albert Einstein. The failure of the disentangling maneuver that was supposed to split up th thick ethical predicates into a value-free cognitive component and a cognition-free emotive component was first seen by Philippa Foote and Iris Murdoch, and then further discussed, as we have seen, by Stanley Cavell and more recently by John McDowell and myself. The moral I wish to draw is a simple one. It's not from any one type of philosophy or any one school of philosophy that enlightenment comes. Enlightenment can come from any type of philosophy. And further, it is important to see how the different sorts of enlightenment that come from different philosophical schools can be related to one another. 
In knowledge and the concept of morality, Cavell shows how a vision of the function of morality can be related on the one hand to all the issues I've just mentioned, and on the other hand to the many other issues discussed in his book, The Claim of Reason. Yet philosophy in, the, in quotes, the more conventional sense can also be education for grown-ups. Philosophy only stops being that when it starts thinking of itself as a collection of specialties, like medical specialties. But philosophy, even in the more conventional sense, need not and must not think of itself in that way. It is when different insights from different sources are connected with each other that philosophy truly educates us. Thank you. I'd now like to call on the Registrar Deputy President, Philip Nolan, to present the Ulysses Medal to Professor Putnam. Thank you very much. I'd just like to make a few remarks before I do present the medal. Um, this, this is uh, a wonderful moment for UCD, and it's also a particularly personal privilege uh, for me uh, to present this medal. Uh, to Hilary Putnam. Um, if I can be personal, just, just for a moment, and personalize this, that the, the fact-value dichotomy is a lived experience for any scientist who reflects upon their own work. And it's something certainly in my own formation um, that I struggled with. It's very difficult to deal with these things called facts, to realize how theory-laden any given fact is, to wonder why uh, scientific arguments can evoke such passion between two people if it all reduces itself to a difference of opinion about facts. And of course, realizing that there's a whole wonder to the scientific endeavor uh, that's unrevealed if one leaves out the aesthetic of what one, do, one is doing and, and, and the aesthetic of the, the, the theory and, and, and its influence upon one's interpretation of events. Um, and as a young man, uh, I was struggling with these concepts and at the same time trying to do my work. Um, and uh, in, I think it was 96 or maybe early 97, uh, the professor of anatomy came lumbering into my office and said, I've read a great book, I think you might like it. And of course it was uh, Hilary Putnam's uh, Renewing Philosophy. Um, and I'm delighted to see that you're open to uh, uh, multiple paths to enlightenment, because certainly the professor of anatomy is a most unlikely path <laughs> for, for enlightenment of, of, of this order. And it certainly was, um, it was an education. I felt just about growing up enough to, to deal with it. And, and for that reason, uh, it's a very particular personal pre pleasure and privilege to find myself after the lapse of, of 10 years, to find myself in this room at this time with the author of, of that book. Um, there, is a, there is a connection, however tenuous one might say it is, between Hilary Putnam and uh, James Joyce. Um, your father, Samuel Putnam, um, was a notable literary figure, and you spent, I believe, the first six years of your life in, in Paris with, uh, with uh, Hilary's father in the circle of, of, of people such as Joyce. So again, I think it's, it's wonderful that this medal, um, uh, instituted in our 150th year, uh, a few short years ago, um, is uh, the highest honor that this university has to bestow. I suspect it's both a value judgment and a fact. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is an indication of the esteem in, in which you're held, uh, not only within your discipline, but the, the reason for the earlier personal story is the impact of your work outside your discipline uh, is uh, quite extraordinary. So I would, without any further ado, like to present you, Professor Hilary Putnam, with the Ulysses Medal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.